All right, welcome everyone to the School Marketing Show Live. My name is Kristen and I'm joined by Mia as always. And if you haven't been with us before for the School Marketing Show Live, really here at Final Sight Professional Development and Education are at the core of our culture. So the show is just a new way to keep our schools and districts around the world in the know about best practices on marketing, communications, admissions, advancement, you name it, we cover it. Um, so each episode will be covering the ins and outs of those strategies. We do this in a live format so that we can hear from you. So please make sure to use the comment section wherever you're viewing this, whether it's live or recorded later. Let us know what kinds of things you'd like to hear from us so that it can help inform what topics we use in the future. So last episode, we talked about advertising pitfalls and how just in general, advertising strategies have evolved over time, especially since the pandemic hit. And while going through this topic and others um, in past episodes, we actually decided to kind of talk about inbound marketing a lot, but we don't really clarify what that is or why you should be thinking about it. So we wanted to take some time in this episode to really dive into what inbound is, why you should care about it, and how you can start implementing it into your strategy. So whether you're interested in inbound marketing, don't know what it is, or are doing it, but not sure if you're doing it right, I encourage you to stop what you're doing right now and join us just for the next 20 minutes or so, and we will dive right in. So just to begin to even really think about the history of inbound, because it's kind of a seemingly buzzword that we kind of started using just a few years ago, but in reality, inbound marketing has been around since 2005. So HubSpot, if you're familiar with the HubSpot platform, their creators actually coined the term inbound back in 2005. At the time, you know, the internet was growing, new strategies um, to really be found online became a necessity. And just inspired by the concept of people really starting to ignore traditional ads and wanting to be served information in new ways, HubSpot, you know, formed, created the inbound methodology, and it was pretty ahead of its time um, at the time in 2005. So really as HubSpot grew and they started, you know, using this a little more and SEO started to become really huge, um, inbound methodology really started to take off around 2012. So just a few years ago, that's really when we started to recognize it as a really valuable strategy to take on. And today it's really the big foundation of successful marketing campaigns. So it's really important to be talking about, and we're so glad that we're bringing it up right now, but I'll first just pass it over to Mia to really kind of differentiate what uh, inbound is versus traditional marketing and what really used to work with marketing. Yeah, thanks, Kristen. And it feels like I, I imagine that we are getting to the point in, in marketing history or marketing strategy where inbound marketing is just marketing. Like, I feel like we have to slowly be getting there because um, whether you're still using some outbound or traditional methods of marketing, it's all going to come together in that funnel. So um, if you've been using traditional marketing techniques, you've probably relied on word of mouth marketing, um, maybe some memorable taglines. You know, when we think of big brands in particular, we know their brand because we know their tagline. We can think of Nike, just do it. So using that as the cornerstone of our brand and then just hoping that they land on our website and buy our product. Of course, we then also have traditional media. We have radio, we have billboards, we have print, we have television. Um, but unfortunately with all of these mediums, there's never been a way to really track the success um, of foot traffic or uh, traffic to your website or inquiries at your school. Um, because you know, there's no real digital medium involved there. And I think, um, you know, with traditional marketing, we weren't always thinking about, okay, we're going to put this message out there and we're going to track to see who viewed it. And then we're going to basically take who viewed it and try to like nurture them through this inbound marketing funnel to get them to be an enrolled student. I think we just relied on this ability for people to know who we are, get our name out there, throwing things at the wall, hope it sticks with enough people to keep our school open. We relied on those uh, super happy parents to tell all of their friends that this is a great school and whatnot. Um, and I think that as we all know, there's still definitely a place for some of these traditional methodologies within the inbound methodology, inbound marketing framework, but there are some really clear pitfalls and flaws with only ever relying on those traditional marketing methods 
um, and not implementing that inbound marketing framework and that inbound marketing funnel and really understanding how you get someone from listening to a radio ad to actually becoming an enrolled student at your school. So Kristen, let's maybe take a moment to talk about some of those outdated flaw or those flaws of that outdated uh, traditional marketing techniques. Yeah, absolutely. So as Mia said, I mean, all of these methods aren't so outdated that they shouldn't be used anymore. Um, but I do think when we're thinking of inbound versus outbound and really today's marketing, which is inbound, there are some flaws when you think more in that traditional methodology of, you know, just casting a wide net. So what you think when you're doing that kind of strategy, again, you're casting a wide net, you're hoping to catch something, but you're not exactly sure who you're reaching at what time. I mean, of course, with like radio ads, you can control the time that they're going out, things like that, but you're not really being able to hone in on your audience. So that's one flaw. Second is that you can't really personalize to help increase the chances of a conversion. So again, when you're thinking something like print media or radio, you can't exactly hone in on that audience and personalize it, the message, just because it's a one blanket message, it's going out to everybody. It's not something that you can personalize specifically to segmented audiences. So that's the second flaw. Third is that really no one wants to be marketed to anymore. So if you really think about it, I think it was was not that long ago that ad blockers started to come out and people were really getting sick of having these repetitive messages coming to them. It was really kind of muddying up all of the content that they wanted to see online. And while we don't want to be marketed to anymore, we do want to be informed and we do want to have a seamless experience when we're searching for something. And that's really where inbound comes into play and where the outbound methodology doesn't really work on its own anymore because we don't want to see that repetitive messaging. We don't want to not be seeing the message that we're actually looking for in terms of getting our own answers. So it has to be more personalized and it has to come to us when we're actually looking for it. And then fourth, um, just in general, why this doesn't work so much on its own is that you can't have a concrete way to measure success. So with more inbound methodology um, strategies, you know, you can look at data, you can look at your analytics, you can see how ads are performing online and things like that. But when you're thinking more print media or, um, you know, television ads, things like that, really the only way to measure that success is to see, okay, do we have foot traffic coming into our campus or do we have people calling and is it, you know, up more from when before we started marketing? And that's a really tough thing to track when you're, you know, putting out all of this messaging at once. When you do more inbound methods, which we will get into, you can actually track that and then adjust moving forward. So I'll actually let Mia take it then where the inbound methodology falls here. Yeah, absolutely. So I think another key thing just to talk about in terms of inbound marketing versus traditional is, Kristen, a lot of those methods that we talked about, billboards, radio, TV, those are all very expensive mediums where you don't necessarily absolutely. know like who you're reaching. Of course, if you're purchasing ad space, you obviously have an idea of maybe who's in the car at that time or who often drives down that highway um, or who's watching the evening news, right? But those are really expensive places to advertise and to not know the ROI that you're getting out of that investment is crazy. And I think especially now when everything is virtual in a lot of cases, yes, we do have some private schools who might be opening um, or who are currently open um, and plenty of public schools who are also open right now. I think there's a lot of areas where I think when we're looking to invest our time and our financial resources, it's probably not going to be in billboards. Um, but we also have to ask ourselves, where should we be redirecting all of those time and resources to in order to get more people to visit our website and to engage with our campus online and to inquire um, and to learn more? So this really is, you know, inbound marketing is at the heart of any good marketing strategy. And really, um, a lot of people talk about the inbound marketing funnel. Um, and for a long time, that funnel was really what drove the inbound marketing funnel or the inbound marketing strategy. You're probably familiar with it. It's attract, engage, convert, and delight. Recently, that's kind of converted itself into a flywheel. So instead of going just straight down in the funnel, it's a circle. It's a cyclical um, methodology because, again, going all the way back to the beginning, that word of mouth marketing, happy, client, happy families are going to promote your school to their friends their family, people in Facebook groups, online to total strangers. And as we all know, 
in the age of the internet, people take a recommendation from a stranger um, as much as a personal recommendation. So there are going to be parents out there advocating for you. Um, and then of course, those same people who are happy at your school are going to give back and make it possible for your school to continue to thrive. So um, that's the main reason why we've seen that switch from the funnel to the flywheel format. I think in a lot of cases, if you are planning or looking at images or even creating an image to maybe present at a marketing meeting, using the funnel is also totally acceptable at this point. But just keeping in mind that really this methodology is intended to be like a full cycle, a full circle here. Uh, basically, happy families bring in more happy families and so forth. But inbound is so important because in most marketing strategies, when we don't look at it from an inbound perspective, whether it's from the funnel perspective or the flywheel perspective, we are putting out a billboard and telling them to go to our website. We are creating a radio ad and telling them to go to our website. And you know, we're putting maybe um, putting out a print ad and telling them to go to our website. We're just telling them to go to our homepage. In no way, like Kristen, like you said, are we personalizing that experience? Are we doing anything to really help get them from that, you know, ad to website visit to conversion? And it's really that conversion that we need in order to continue to market to these families. So what inbound marketing allows us to do is to get the right people to our website based on what they're searching for in Google, um, you know, where they spend their time online or on social media getting them to our website, making that experience feel like it was made just for them so much that they're inspired to convert. Then once they convert, we don't ever miss an opportunity to keep them engaged. Um, we can use retargeting ads, we can use email, which we'll get to in a second, to keep them engaged. And then of course, all the way to the point to applying and rolling and maintaining at your school. The inbound marketing methodology is like a full like map. It's a full roadmap. It's not you're putting money into a billboard and sitting and waiting at your desk, hoping someone checks the box on the inquiry form that says, how did you hear about us? And they select billboard. It's like a proven almost, I don't want to say set it and forget it because it's not because we're always working. But it's like once you have all your tools in place that you need to get people to your website, convert them on your website and keep them engaged with your school after they've inquired, applied or requested a view book, like you're good, you don't need a billboard, you don't need a print ad, you don't need all these expensive mediums that traditional marketing has available. So that being said, I do, um, Kristen, I wanna hand it back to you to just talk about putting some of these strategies into place. So we do have, we've kind of bucketed this, we've taken a step out of the funnel and said, okay, how do we really bucket this in terms of what you might be used to saying in terms of your goals? So we have, turning strangers, so people who have either never been to your website, never heard of your school, or maybe did hear about your school through word of mouth, maybe a billboard, maybe a radio ad, how do we turn them into a website visitor? Then once they're a website visitor, how do you get them into your system? How do you get them to inquire, apply, request a view book, subscribe to your blog? Okay, those I almost want to say are the two easy parts now we're getting to the two harder parts. So how do we turn those inquiries or applicants into an enrolled student? And then how do we turn that enrolled student into an engaged alumni who continues to give back to your school, whether you know financially or with their time? So those are really the four buckets. Those fall into the different categories of the flywheel. But Kristen, let's talk about that first one because there's really so many pieces to this that don't include billboards, TV, or radio ads. Right. Yeah, so like as Mia just said, I mean, the traditional way of thinking about the inbound marketing flywheel is of attract, engage, convert, delight. That's like the coined, you know, terms, but it's really hard to put your own practices into place when you're thinking about it that way. So when we're thinking about these four steps that Mia just laid out, the first one really is to turn strangers into website visitors. So that's the attract phase. So you're trying to get, you know, potential families to your website. And how do you do that? That's not a traditional way and more of the inbound way. So first and foremost, SEO. I think it's something we talk about all the time. You know, search engine optimization is so important. Just say that we research now. I mean, we we search so many times before actually making a decision. And being sure that your website is actually optimized for the terms that you're trying to rank for, um, whether you can or not, depending on the competition there, if you're trying to reach families that are searching for, you know, independent schools in your area or international schools in your area and so on. 
SEO will be key here. So making sure that your website's actually up to date, it has relevant content that actually matches what searchers are looking for, that will work in your favor for getting you know, families into your funnel there. Second is P PPC, so advertising on search engines. That's also important in the tract phase, just as you're trying to beat out competition, you're trying to get that number one spot on search results pages, PPC will be your best friend here. And if you haven't already, I would recommend watching our previous episode on episode six of the School Marketing Show, where we go into you know advertising pitfalls and what you can do. Third is blogging. If you don't have a blog for your school or district already, blogging is an awesome way of getting really relevant, more top of the funnel content onto your website. Um, if you're looking to reach families who are searching for more general things like what are the benefits of going to a private school over a public school or even vice versa and having a blog on that something that is relevant for SEO that you can provide really great thought leadership on a blog is fantastic for that. Fourth is social media. So if you have or don't have a social media presence already I recommend it, especially on things like Facebook Instagram where your potential families and parents definitely are you know, having a consistent presence there will be in your favor just in terms of the way that search engines work and how they rank. So if someone is looking for schools in their area, your Facebook page can absolutely pop up on that first page of results if you have it and if you are consistently engaged on it. So social media is key. And then just in general, your website experience. So you want to make sure that when strangers are arriving, that you give the best first impression that you can possible. So making sure that your design is clean, making sure that the user experience is working and is modern in terms of your navigation and things like that you want to be able to offer everyone the best most seamless experience as possible once they arrive in your digital campus really which is what we've been saying so much recently this is your virtual first impression so making sure that that experience is great so that's all how you can really get strangers to your website and how you can potentially get them into your funnel so Number two, like Mia mentioned earlier, is turning those website visitors then into inquiries or applicants. So you don't want to get them to your website and then not offer more opportunities. So Mia, what would what would you recommend for this uh, next step? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is where we often see a lot of school inbound marketing strategies kind of just like fall apart at the seams entirely. I think we see a lot of heads of school and a lot of superintendents saying, oh, we need to do SEO and we need to invest in PPC and we need social media ads. And, you know, even in the case of say, hey, you're doing billboards and t like radio ads and TV spots, even this is still the part where your marketing strategy can completely just fall apart at the seams because as you invest time and resources and your budget into these marketing methodologies, once they get to your website, you need a way to actually get them in your funnel. Like you need their information so that you can continue to connect with them and market to them. And this is where we see a lot of butting of heads between marketing and admissions because admissions wants to use their long SIS or admission software form as the only form on the website. And I often see marketing being there like, hey, like, can we just have like a two field form for like downloading our view book? And it's this constant butting of heads. And I will say like, it's the constant butting of heads and just the fact that those long forms exist on your website that you're going to see your inbound marketing or just traditional marketing methodology fall apart. You can't stay in the minds of your prospective families without really getting their information and getting to know them. So when it comes to crafting, um, you know, forms that convert and pages that convert, we really need to focus on the form length. So keeping forms, especially for top of the funnel, um, you know, beneath five form fields. I think, you know, when it comes to your inquiries, view book downloads, um, you know, blog subscriptions, keeping those really short and light, of course your application form is going to be longer. They're literally applying at your school. But what we found out, we actually um, hosted our virtual admissions, you know, workshop a couple of weeks ago. And when we asked someone, we asked everyone there, like, what happens when someone inquires at your school? No two people have the same response. And that means that any family who's inquiring at your school, if they're inquiring at your school in multiple schools, that experience isn't going to be the same. And then a lot of times all they're getting is a view book or a simple email. So when we look at those really long forms, that's a lot of information to provide just to have someone send me an email with a view book. Okay, so we really need to think about how we can get people in our system in a lot of ways that's shortening in the form. Another way is dedicated landing pages. So when we are building a PPC ad or we're building a social media ad, building a page that corresponds to the intent of that ad, 
we often see people just sending individuals to, you know, home pages or random pages on their website um, without really any opportunity to convert or anything that has specific language. So just making sure again, the experience on pages on your website seems personalized, it seems direct. Um, but I think, you know, it's definitely the area that we see our schools struggle with the most. I think part of it is a staffing thing where again, there, there is a lot of butting of heads. Um, but I also think, you know, it's a lot, Kristen, like we do it here. It's a lot to create like 20 different PPC pages. Like that all, <laughs> that all have slightly different messaging to appeal to the 20 different campaigns you're running. Like it's a lot of work. And I think we talk to a lot of schools who have small shops, but I will say this time and time again, like, please, please, please like do not invest money into PPC or, you know, uh, social media ads without building some type of targeted landing page strategy. And certainly don't send them to a page with your 50 form field long <laughs> inquiry form. I mean, it's just a, like, if you're doing that, you might as well be buying billboards and putting them in a different language. Like it's <laughs> like all of that is a waste of money. So again, when we think of traditional marketing versus inbound traditional, it's very easy to think of it in silos. I'm putting up a billboard that has our website. Cool. When we think of inbound, it's like, okay, I'm going to put up a billboard on highway 95 because I know that the majority of our families we're trying to recruit use Highway 95 as their key way to get to work. On that billboard, I'm going to have a specific landing page built for yourschool.org slash 95. You go to that page, it's going to have a really short form to reach out and learn more about our school from an admissions representative. Then I'm going to directly track the traffic to that page and the conversions on that form to say whether or not that billboard was successful. And we can do the same thing for our search ads, for our social media ads, but if we don't do that and we don't care about the conversions, then your inbound marketing strategy is going to be just as flimsy as your TV, radio, and billboard ads. So I'll get off my soapbox on that, <laughs> but I clearly feel very passionate about it. And I think that again, like it's so easy to say, oh, we do SEO, we do PPC, we do inbound. And it's just like, if you are sending people to an inquiry form that's 50 fields long on a social media ad, you're not doing inbound correctly. Um, so, <laughs> um, so yes, an inbound marketing strategy can have plenty of flaws as well. Um, you know, but once we've gotten them to convert, Kristen, that next important stage of turning them into an actual lead, like not just someone who visited the website and we managed to get their information because our content was just so awesome and our form was so short. Um, but we have that next stage that's so, so key. And it's actually getting that initial conversion all the way through the funnel to potentially enrolling at our school. So let's talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think aside from obviously the frustrations of maybe investing money into something that doesn't work because you're not, you know, making sure that you have those dedicated landing pages and you have compelling calls to action. So important. I think that and a piece that often gets lost then is that you get the inquiry or you get even the application and that's so great, but there's still so much to be done to make sure that you get that applicant or that inquiry all the way through to an enrolled student. So Two main things that I would challenge you with taking a look at. First is definitely email marketing. So making sure that you have automation set. So if someone inquires or applies even, that they automatically get put into a dedicated workflow that offers you know, more information about your school, thanks them for inquiring or even applying, offering additional you know, useful content. That's where, that's a piece that can get lost so quickly. And then you'll end up not seeing that enrolled family because you didn't nurture them the whole way through to the funnel. So you're not done yet. Obviously, if you get an applicant or an inquiry, you want to make sure that you're still providing that really nice, um, you know, voice of knowledge and being a helpful resource as this family is still in their journey because they're no doubt, you know, inquiring and possibly applying at other schools as well. So Having that email strategy in place will be so key here, in addition to taking a look at your data. So making sure that if you do have a dedicated form that a family is filling out to inquire or apply, that you're taking a look at that data, segmenting lists where it makes sense, um, making sure that you're looking at what's performing and with your emails as well and what's not so that you can improve moving forward. I would say, um, I know personally, Mia actually just shared an anecdote with me about her journey, you know, finding a school for her son. And yeah, I'm not sure if you'd be willing to share. I feel like she told me, you know, you had a, 
an experience where you applied, but you weren't really ready to enroll and the place actually assumed that you were enrolled. And that can be another area with a pitfall in this stage where you can really, you know, see applicants drop off. So I don't know if you'd be willing to share. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, um, I was, you know, I was, I had looked at quite a few um, daycares in the area. My son's, you know, just one and a half. So um, I was trying to find the perfect place for him. And I, uh, you know, applied at a few of the places in the area. And I ended up choosing another one because I had never heard back from one in particular, just ever. Like, I, <laughs> I don't even know what happened to them. Um, and then this other school, like out of nowhere, I just start getting all of these. I've never heard from this. This is back in like February. So before, um, you know, the whole COVID outbreak and everything closed. I had applied to this place and I just never heard from them again. And this other place had fantastic communication. Like I immediately got um, added to a Facebook group. I was in like their weekly newsletter and I was like so happy as a school marketer. I was like, oh, I totally picked the best school because I'm in a private Facebook group for my kid's classroom and I'm in their monthly newsletter and I haven't even paid my first tuition payment. All I did was like apply and pay like the registration fee. But this other school out of nowhere just starts sending me all of these emails to log into my parent portal and like that William's going to be in this classroom. And like, then they start calling me and I'm just like, you guys, like you never even reached out one time in the past, like six months. If you can't, if you, can't, if you can't send me one email over six months, except for the one where you ask for my money, like my kid isn't going to your school because again, like William's only a year and a half. So communication is key. Like I want to know exactly what's happening every minute of the day that my child is not with me. But I think that goes true for any school. It's like, that is your first impression of communication and marketing. It's like, if your first impression is silence, that's a really bad first impression. And I think we talk a lot of it, a lot about high commitment, um, website visitors and low commitment website visitors and how like your high commitment person will always like do whatever they can to fill out your form and your low commitment takes more convincing. I think the same can be said at this stage of the funnel. Like you have people where it's like, whether or not you sent them like, um, like a stone to like sign with like a rock and they're like, please, um, this is the only way you can enroll at our school is if you sign this rock, um, people would do it. And then you have other people who are kind of like they've applied to three schools. They're not really sold on anything. Like those are the people that will make or break your enrollment. And we're like, this part of the funnel is so, so key because I think we know it's like, I think there's probably again, high commitment people might only apply to one place, but those low commitment people are applying to numerous places. Um, they're seeing where they might get scholarships. They're seeing who has good communication. I think again, this is another place where it's so easy to let your inbound marketing strategy fall off the rails because you just simply don't have time. But I feel like time shouldn't be an excuse when you have people who spent so much time <laughs> with your school already. And then you're like, oh, it's good enough. Like, right. they'll, 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 they'll enroll. <laughs> No, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think there it was so funny, just two opposite ends of the spectrum with what you experienced there, because obviously the first one is that you were kind of ghosted. No one contacted you. you and that's, I think, the first lesson here is that you don't want to ever assume that the family is so motivated that they will just continue to stay in contact with you. You really have to cultivate that relationship. And two, um, making the assumption that they already are ready to enroll. I think that's the, the opposite end of what you don't want to do there, that you, you really want to lightly nurture them, really take a human approach, really just have an honest human conversation with them, making sure that you're you know catching or uh, touching base with them. And then that'll really help you get the whole way through to the end of your funnel and enroll. And I think that that's where this takes us into the very last step that really takes the inbound methodology to the next level. And that's enrolling students and making sure that they become engaged alumni. So Mia, would you mind, uh, you know, speaking to that? Yeah, so I think this is this is pretty similar to the sense of, you know, once you've gotten someone to apply, you want to keep them engaged enough where they, you know, enroll at your school. Um, and then once they're enrolled at your school, I mean, if they're unhappy, and any, I always find it's kind of the same thing with reviews. Like anytime you read reviews, there's always like a five star and a one star. It's like when I'm looking for reviews at a restaurant, like I read the three star review. Like I don't want to know about the person who had a terrible time. And I don't want to hear about the person who had a fantastic time. I want to know about the person who was like, yeah, the burger was good, but like the ambiance was kind of lame. Like I want to hear that person because it's like, okay, I don't care about the ambiance. All I care about is my burger. <laughs> 
I feel like the same can be said about parents at your school. You're always going to have like those raw, raw parents. Again, we're no matter what, they're high commitment. They love your school. They like rep your swag. They have like the bumper sticker on your car, on their car. Any of their friends who are like, oh, how does Kristen like school? It's like, Kristen loves school. Your kids should go there. Like pull them out of wherever they are. Some, like there's always going to be those parents. And then you're going to have the parents who no matter what they do, they complain. You cannot make them happy. They leave negative comments on social media. They send you mean inboxes. <laughs> They're always <laughs> complaining. Nothing you do is right. No matter how hard you try and you're never going to appease that person. And, but it's those middle of the road parents that you never hear from that again can make or break your enrollment here because they're always the people who are like, they're happy, they're good, but they're the people you really need to keep engaged so that when you ask for a donation or you ask for their time to help at an event, or you ask them to take a photo of their child learning from home, or you ask them literally for anything, they're like, oh yeah, I do that. Like I would do that. I've definitely seen the value that your school offers. Like I'm not volunteering, but yeah, sure. Totally. Like, because you asked nicely, I'll do that. And I think when it comes to this stage of the funnel, it's all about just consistent communications and consistent quality in your communications. So I'm not asking you to have a million different personalized workflows. I'm asking for like a monthly newsletter that just keeps people informed with what's going on at your school and what's going on in your community, just for them to be able to see the value. Um, so when you do go to ask for something in the future, whatever that may be, they aren't discouraged. And I think it also helps them feel like they're a part of the community. It keeps those raw, raw people happy. It keeps those middle of the road people engaged. And it keeps those people who complain about everything at least informed as to what's going on at your school and reaffirming that you really are just doing your best. Um, so yeah, I think that's, you know, with this stage of the funnel, I don't want to say it's the least important because these are the people who are going to refer your school and obviously keep your enrollment up. But I think that if like, we're going to folk in order to have this stage of the funnel to work on those top three are so, so, so important. And I do want to say like one more thing and I don't know where this fits in, but I know we talked about this, Kristen, like there's always that 70, 20, 10 rule when it comes to social media or that rule of thirds. And I think the same can be said about your email communications for your current families. You can't only email them when you have to ask for something. And so Absolutely. I think when you're creating a newsletter or you're posting on social media, or you're even posting content on your website, it can not always be like, take the survey, please donate to this. Do you have time to do this? I think those current family communications following like a 70, 20, 10 rule of talking about, um, you know, value and educating them and entertaining them the majority of the time so that you can ask for something down the road is so key here. And I feel like I don't really ever see that talked about in terms of like email strategy for current families. It's always just like, oh, we'll tell them like, send them the news. It's like, well, maybe they don't care about the news. Maybe they just need like an inspirational quote to get through the week. <laughs> so yeah, so consider if that's, if you really feel like you have like the whole funnel down to a science and like you don't know where you can improve, take a look at your emails and say, do these follow up a rule of thirds or a 70, 20, 10 rule. And Kristen, I'm saying that assuming everyone who's listening knows that, but I mean, could you quickly <laughs> define what those two rules might mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you, um, you know, haven't been uh, with me or Mia before, like on a social media presentation, we often speak about the 70, 20, 10 rule. And really the idea there is that 70% of your content really will be that engaging, fun, um, you know, less educational content. 20% can really be dedicated more to that important information, educational content, um, and, you know, self-promoting things. Same with it. that last 10% can be, you know, promotions, events, things like that. And then in that 20%, things like shared content from thought leaders, things like that. And then your main 70%. So really the majority of your content should be more on that engaging side. So I think that that's a really good point when you're thinking about your email strategy, you really should be going in with the same thought process that you're looking to engage with them. You're looking to, um, you know, I, I don't like using the term delight with the inbound marketing funnel, but that is the term toward the end of the flywheel there is that you're really trying to continue to engage with them and provide, you know, information that they actually want to see rather than what you want them to see. So um, if you're thinking with that idea, I think it'll really help with your email strategy as well. Yeah. Thank you for defining that. Cause I feel like <laughs> that's the whole reason we did this episode is I feel like we're always talking like way in the weeds without ever talking about big picture, but thank you, Kristen. And we are way over our normal time here for our school marketing show, but it's a big topic to cover. I think it's definitely hard to cover in just 15 or 20 minutes, but 
we do have some news. Um, we will be moving to a monthly, or not monthly, my goodness, we are going to be moving to a weekly episode with the goal of providing some more tactical short bites of information on a weekly basis for you guys. So instead of always covering these big picture topics, be able to dive into the nitty gritty um, of one specific thing that's super like timely and just tactical. It's not going to be like these big picture things. So next week, we're actually going to be talking about something we get a ton of questions around all the time that we see people stressing out about all the time. And it's comments and messages on social media and how to dedicate time to responding to comments and how to actually respond to comments, what to do if someone leaves a negative comment. So we're going to be changing the format and structure of this show just a bit because we feel like, you know, we just wrapped up our six weeks of summer camp. And by the end of that six weeks, you can just feel like the emotional weight of the global pandemic on everyone's shoulders. And at this point, we're all just trying to get through like every single day. And so our goal over the next however long of the school marketing show is to really just help give you strategies to just get through your week. <laughs> um, so if you have anything that is pressing you, driving you crazy that you need help with, drop a comment below, send myself or Kristen an email. We'd love to use it as a topic for the school marketing show. But again, next week, hopefully it'll be much shorter bites of information moving ahead here. Um, and again, next week we'll be covering social media comments, negative comments, messages, um, and how to deal with them. So Thanks so much for listening in on uh, episode seven of the School Marketing Show, and we're excited to be here next week again. Thanks, everyone.